We've been working through a series, uh, What I Love About Jesus Is. Uh, The aim of this series is to help us think about how to share things we love about Jesus uh, with those around us during the week. Uh, in a, in a world where truth is defined often uh, by what we love, our truth is defined by me. This is an easy way to share the timeless, eternal, historically verifiable truths about Jesus Christ. Uh, today, what I love about Jesus is he is faithful. And the reading that we have today is from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. You'll find that on the screen or you can follow in your Bibles at home. Luke Chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Then Jesus returned from the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone. So he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I'll give you their splendor and all this authority because it's been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want. If you then will worship me, all will be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So he took him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you and they'll support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not test the Lord your God. After the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Uh, We've prayed about that this morning already, but again, we thank you uh, that in your word we can know you, know ourselves, know restoration through Christ alone, who is your word in the flesh. Thank you that Jesus is faithful, faithful in trusting you, taking you at your word and living like it, unlike any other human being. Thank you that in this there is good news. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, like I said, we've been working on a series over summer. What I love about Jesus is uh, in a modern world, uh, the world that perhaps our parents grew up in or maybe some of us grew up in, uh, that world uh, is a world of truth which is verifiable, testable. Uh, You can examine it and measure it and that's the way the world works. Uh, We're not living in that kind of world anymore. Uh, Our world is a postmodern world. Uh, where truth is defined by personal experience, uh, truth is relative, and truth is conveyed by emotion. And one of the things we need to be thinking about is how do I share Jesus in this new world, this postmodern world? Uh, one way to do that is to talk about the stuff we love about him, uh, introduce him to people as a person. And that's what we've been doing over this summer period. Uh, We've looked at what I love about Jesus is he is a man. What I love about Jesus is he is God. What I love about Jesus is he is good news. And today what I love about Jesus is he is faithful. But let me start with a movie. Uh, It's a movie I saw a long time ago. There's an outline there and you can follow along on the outline. I'm at point one and send any questions or comments or queries you might have uh, using the comments box on the bottom of the page. But let me start with a movie, a movie I saw a while ago. Catch me if you can. It's a movie about the life of Frank Abagnale. I'd never known about this man until I watched the movie, played by Leonardo DiCaprio. He's one of the greatest fraudsters in American history. Uh, He succeeds in his lifetime uh, in impersonating a Pan Am pilot, an attorney and a doctor. He succeeds in embezzling millions of dollars. He's eventually caught. He succeeds in his frauds because he can persuade people he is something he is not. It's always the case with fraud, isn't it? People want to know if you really are who you say you are. Can you be trusted? Fraud is about duping people into thinking that you're something that you're not. Ultimately, people's expectations are raised and crushed and trust is lost. Well, lost. The the claims made for Jesus before his birth were significant. Uh, He was described by the angel Gabriel in this way as he talks to Mary. 
You will conceive and give birth to a son. You'll call his name Jesus. He'll be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He'll reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Luke 1, 31 and following. Now, the claims for Jesus are significant and they turn on a very crucial truth, his identity, his identity. He's clearly identified by the angel Gabriel as the Son of God. And that identity is crucial to the claims made about him. If that identity is false, fraudulent, he is a fraud, if he is exposed as unable to match that identity, then all the claims about Jesus fall. And his work, his mission cannot be carried out. It's not an insignificant issue, is it? After all, the first son of God, the first human who bore the image of God, Adam, fell. The next human described in son of God terms, David, well, he fell. Even the nation of God's people described in child imagery like a son of God and given the job of representing God to the world like every human being, even that nation, Abraham's family, yet you guessed it, they fell, they failed. And at the heart of all of those failures to be the son of God was a lack of faith. Put simply, Adam David and God's people did not take God at his word and live like it. They doubted God's ability to be and to do as he said, and so they took matters into their own hands. Put simply, they sinned. They said, I am God and God is not because I don't trust him. I don't think he can do and be what he says. They were unfaithful. In fact, that's the situation for everyone who bears the image of God, which means it's a situation for every human being. All human beings prove unfaithful to the image they bear, the image of God, because they doubt whether God can do and be what he says. Now, can Jesus be any different, especially when he's identified so clearly as the Son of God? Is Jesus any different? Let me be very clear again. The claim is certainly made for Jesus, even by Jesus, that he is God's son. I'm at point two on the outline. In Luke 2, verse 49, he identifies himself that God is his father. In Luke 3, 21 to 22, at his baptism, God himself identifies Jesus as his son. A very significant moment there in Luke 3, 21 to 22, when God speaks and God uses the words of Psalm 2 and Isaiah 42 and says, this is my boy. He uses Psalm 2 because this affirms what was predicted about Jesus, the great coronation psalm, the great coronation poem of the kings of God's people that God's son would rule the universe, that as God's son he would fulfill the intention that God had for all humans, that he would rule the world under God's word. As God uses Isaiah 42, it affirms that God's son, Jesus, is the one that serves God in complete dependence upon God, strengthened by God alone. And following that, in Luke 3, 23 to 28, Luke lays out the genealogical background for Jesus, his birth records, if you like, which identify Jesus down there in verse 38 as son of Adam, son of God. And it's that last identification that is really important as we seek to understand the substance of Jesus' identity. You see, as the son of God, Luke identifies him as the son of Adam. In fact, the two are inseparably linked. You can't separate them from each other. To be the true son of God means that you are truly human. And to be truly human, human as God created you to be, is to be identified as the son of God. Here's the key then for understanding whether Jesus can do and be everything promised of him. Can he be human in a way that no other human has ever been? Can he prove faithful in trusting God? And in that and in that alone, he will be either proven or discredited as God's son. Well, as has been the case right throughout his life recorder, I'm at point three on the outline, uh, God remains the chief actor in the life of Jesus. Look there in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Luke 4, verses 1 and 2. Then Jesus returned from the Jordan, full of the Holy Spirit. He was baptised at the Jordan, full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was hungry. 
God himself led Jesus into the desert, into the wilderness. God did this so that he could be tempted by the devil. That plays a very interesting perspective on temptation, given that we know the truth of the rest of the Bible, that God tests rather than tempts. In fact, in the Greek, the same word is translated in two different ways, depending on who's doing what. The temptation of Jesus by the devil at God's hand is the testing of Jesus by his father, the proving that he really is the son of God, fully human in a way that no other human has ever been, completely faithful. Well, after his 40 days without food, the devil arrives to tempt Jesus. It's there in verse 3. The connections back to the three sons of God that I've already mentioned before can't be missed, like Israel, God's people, Abraham's family. Jesus is tempted during a period of 40. Like David, Jesus is tested as to his dependence upon God as the promise keeper. Like Adam, Jesus is tested face to face by the devil. Each temptation is a test in itself, a study. But we must notice that the devil in each of them is attempting to expose, undo the identity of Jesus and so his capability to do his job. If you look closely there, you'll see that the first and the third temptation are explicitly introduced as an attack on Jesus' identity as the Son of God. If you are the Son of God, then. Well, let's have a go at that identity. That seems to be the devil's intention. And the second, sandwiched in the middle, is an attack couched in the promise that's made to the Son of God in Psalm 2, that God will make him the ruler of the world. So all three temptations are focused at Jesus' identity as the Son of God. And it aims to undermine that identity, expose Jesus as a fraud. Here before Jesus even begins his public ministry, the devil wants to bring him unstuck, to show that he's a fraud, to display that Jesus is just like every other human being unfaithful, sinful, a man who takes matters into his own hands because he doesn't trust God. So what we get to see here is whether Jesus is like every other person in the world, every other image bearer of God, every other son of Adam in the family tree. Well, the first temptation focuses on whether Jesus trusts God's word. Look there at verse 3. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. After all, God's clearly stated that Jesus is his beloved son in whom he delights. What what doting father allows his own son to starve? Well, Jesus has got to take matters into his own hands because obviously God's word can't be trusted. Jesus is hungry, so God can't be trusted. So go ahead, Jesus. The second temptation focuses on whether Jesus can trust God's promise. Look at verses Five to six. So he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I'll give you their splendor and all this authority because it has been given over to me. I can give it to anyone I want. If you then will worship me, all will be yours. Jesus, is God really going to follow through on his promise? The promise made in Psalm 2. I mean, here's your opportunity. Take it with both hands. Grasp it. Why wait? Why go the hard path when I'm giving you the easy option? Why go the path of humility when you can take the path of hubris? Why go the path of submitting to God's will when all you have to do is submit to me? All you have to do is to have me as your boss and you can have all this. The third temptation focuses on God's provision and whether Jesus will be provided for. Look down there in verse 9. So he took him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you and they'll support you with their hands so that you'll not strike your foot against a stone. It's always worth testing a father's devotion to his son, especially when he expects so much of his son. Jesus just has to take matters into his own hands and prove how good God is. Go ahead, Jesus, give it a go. Each temptation focuses on encouraging Jesus to take matters into his own hands. That's the essence of sin, isn't it? I in the middle, taking matters into your own hands, saying that God can't do it, so I must do it, saying God's not up to it, so I can be God instead of God. It's to doubt God's ability to do and be, as he said. It's it's not to trust God that he can do as he promised. It's to think and act as if you can do a better job of being God than God. And the temptations that are laid before Jesus here, doubting the word, the promise, and the provision of God, are temptations common to all humans. Just look through that family tree in Luke 2, 23 to 38. 
Adam had the same three temptations from the devil in the garden, surrounded by bounty, not in the wilderness, not hungry in any sense, and Adam fell. Abraham had the same three temptations in his life and he fell. David had the same three temptations in his life and he fell. Even the nation of Israel led into the wilderness by God under judgment who wandered for a period of 40, 40 years had the same three temptations and, yes, you guessed it, they fell. Will this man, Jesus, the Son of God, will he be any different from any of them? It is the fundamental question at the start of Jesus' public ministry and it strikes at both the heart of his identity and so his ability to do the job laid before him. On the one hand, they're all the same temptations we face. On the other hand, though, they're not the same temptations because here the stakes are much higher, aren't they? The consequences are global and eternal. The relationship threatened is at the very heart of the plans and identity of God from Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3. Will Jesus stand firm? Well, Jesus responds to the devil, doesn't he, each time? Did you notice that? He doesn't let one go through to the keeper. And each time he responds, he quotes from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, a record of those three sermons that Moses gave to God's people as they stood on the border of the promised land, ready to go in. Moses couldn't go because he fell. And as they prepare to go into the land, Moses reminds them of who they are and what their relationship with God is like and their job before God. Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy chapters 8 to 6 to respond to the devil. And here in that section, as Moses exhorts God's people to trust God, he exhorts them to have no other God but God. Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 to 6. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. All of Jesus' responses to the devil come from around that in Deuteronomy 6 to 8. God's people are to have no other God but him. God's people are to love him with every fibre of their being. God's people can trust God, must trust God, knowing that his word, his promise, his provision are firm and solid. Each response to the devil is taken from around that statement of what it means to be a person of God, to be someone who represents God to the world. The first quotation from Deuteronomy 8 verse 3, acknowledges that God does provide for his people in the wilderness, but the essence of life is not the bread on the table, but the word of God that brings life into existence. The second quote acknowledges that God deserves undivided loyalty. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 13, because his promises are always true. Just look at history. The third quote acknowledges from Deuteronomy 6 verse 16 that God does provide what his people need. His love never needs testing. His proclamation, his practice and his promise are always certain and he is not stingy in any of them. And so Jesus does something that no other human being has ever done. He resists the devil completely. He resists the devil completely by completely and faithfully trusting God to do and be as he has said. Jesus' identity remains firm, unquestioned. He is the Son of God. His obedience and devotion to God remains established on what God has promised to do and what God has proved trustworthy. in. The devil is resisted for the first time in the family tree. And the words out of Deuteronomy, of Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, the parallel account, are very clear. Then Jesus told him, go away, Satan. And he did. The identity of Jesus is tested by the temptation of the devil to sin. The identity of Jesus is affirmed by his resistance to sin. Not because he's more special than us but because he was obedient where all others have been disobedient. He was faithful at the moment where every other human has been faithless. And in that, in that, Jesus displays his true humanity. He is faithful to God above all things. He trusts God to do and be as he promised. He represents God truthfully to the world. Jesus is exactly like us in every way but this. He proves faithful. He's not a fraud. I'm at point four on the outline. He's not a fraud. He is 
who he says he is, who others say he is, who he says he is. He's the son of God. And his identity is proven as he resists the temptation of the devil to express it by being unfaithful to God. Jesus' identity is proven as he proves faithful to God. What I love about Jesus is that he is faithful. His identity is not a fraud. It's not based on lies. It's not based on false claims. It's not based on records that have been adjusted. It's not based on delusion. It is based on the fact that he has resisted the devil and that means that the hopes of restoration that we talked about last week, the good news that he says he has come to bring remains true, not some pipe dream not some false dream, not some dream that has been raised and so crushed. Listen again to the readings that we have before from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, he also shared in these so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. He had to be like his brothers in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he he himself was tested and has suffered, he is able to help those who are tested. Hebrews 4 verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to the confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. What I love about Jesus is that he is everything that I am and everything that I should be but cannot be. He is a human being, but he is the human who is faithful in trusting God. He is the Son of God, the perfect image bearer of God. That's such a wonderful truth, not because it displays what I can strive to emulate or strive to be. No, it's such a wonderful truth because it displays the one that I need, the one who is like me but resisted sin, the one who resisted doubting God's promise, the one who resisted the temptation of the devil, the one who stood firm as the image bearer of God. What I love about Jesus is that he is faithful and that is who I need to deal with my sin, to open access to God whose image I bear for me. And we're going to see over the next two weeks how that takes place. That being said, we mustn't miss this truth too. As Jesus resists temptation like every human should, I love the fact that he displays in his faithfulness how this is possible, how it's possible to resist sin. It's not because he has any superpower. It's not because he has some unfair divine advantage. That would mean he's not like me. Rather, Jesus displays what it means to take God at his word and live like it. Jesus displays what it means to be faithful. And at the heart of this is the word of God, God's word, which rules all things from basic human desire like hunger and lust for power and influence right through to understanding how life works in all its facets and how to speak and recognize temptation, speak to and recognize temptation. God's word lies at the heart of it. What I love about Jesus being faithful is that he displays how to stand firm against the devil against taking matters into our own hands, against sin. So let me finish with a challenge. First, do you know and love this Jesus who is not a fraud, who is faithful, whose identity as the Son of God is proven as he resists the devil? Do you know him? Second, if you do know him, How might you share this truth about Jesus this week? Jesus is not a fraud. Jesus lived my kind of life but resisted the devil. His identity is sure. How could you share him this week? Third, how might you apply his example of resisting temptation to sin by holding on to God's word? What I love about Jesus is that he is faithful. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thanks that your word comes in the flesh and proves faithful, resists the devil, proves his identity as the son of God, shows his true humanity in a way that no human has ever done before. Thank you.
that Jesus is faithful. And thank you that in his faithfulness in resisting the devil, in trusting you, your word is at the heart of it. Thank you that we can open that word, not just know the word in the flesh, but have the word in the flesh, in the word, in our hands. Father, please bury that word into our souls and hearts and change us by it. In Jesus' name, amen.